Episode 8, Terror Camp Clear, is one of two episodes named after some writing found with one of the skeletons, a collection of papers that belonged to Harry Peglar, in the show The Younger Man and the Nice Gay Couple with a Thing for Books. The body that held the papers wasn't Peglar, though, and in the show it's his older partner, Bridgens. In real life, Bridgens was in his twenties, ten years younger than Peglar, and there's no evidence that they were a couple. The chances are, whoever the skeleton was, was carrying Peglar's papers to return them to his loved ones. Some of the writings were mistaken for German when discovered because they're written in reverse. It's not known why, but it was probably an effort to get some privacy. Where was the terror count the papers mentioned? We don't know, but probably near the terror? But since the ship moved, that doesn't help much. And since it specified terror, the ships may well have separated by that point. But like I said before, there's a lot we don't know. The episode opens with Fitzjames and Crozier leaving the Victory Point message, the last official word received from the expedition. Fitzjames takes the positive message left by Gore previously and scrawls in much darker additions to the edges. Her Majesty's ships Terror and Erebus were deserted on the 22nd of April, five leagues north-northwest of this, having been beset since the 12th of September, 1846. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and fifteen men. It's not mentioned in the show, but Fitzjames got a year wrong. In the original positive message, before Franklin died, he said they had wintered at Beach Island from 1846 to 1847, when we know they wintered there between 1845 and 46 because the graves found there. This is likely because of lead addling, but there is a theory, a pretty mad theory, that he was right. And the expedition spent a second year at Beachy Island, and less time than is accepted at King William Island. But since that theory was championed by the guy who thought the expedition's true purpose was to enter and claim the power of Inuit magic land, I'm going to stick with the lead addling for now. I kind of think I should do a video on the Franklin Conspiracy. What do you think? It was unusual that Fitzjames wrote the original positive message that Gore left. It should have been Franklin. Franklin hadn't died at this point, so this is evidence that he was probably sick and couldn't. On the way back to camp, Fitzjames makes some confessions. How he gained favour by saving Sir John Barrow's son from a scandal. This is true, though we don't know what the scandal was about. Barrow was the head of the Admiralty, and the reason Fitzjames was briefly in the running to command the whole expedition. While this was a reward, we should also remember that Discovery expeditions were dangerous, and Barrow doubtless knew that Fitzjames may die on the voyage, and hopefully would take the secret with them. He also explains that he's a bastard, a huge and shameful deal in Victorian England, that even his name, James Fitzjames, is a joke. James, son of James. His father was Baron James Gambier. He explains that his glory hounding was to cover his insecurity, to become someone that mattered. I'm honestly surprised this made it into the show. You see, it wasn't in the book. Fitzjames only received a biography a few years after the terror was published, and it was William Battersby who wrote it that discovered Fitzjames' parentage. For almost 150 years, his well-crafted fiction of a cover was believed to be the truth. I'm a fake, brother. I challenge any biographer to tally up your acts of valour and then call you a fake. What's interesting is that Fitzjames mentions that his mother wasn't English. Now, that is in Battersby's book. He concluded that Fitzjames's mother was either Portuguese or Brazilian, and he may well have been born in Brazil. That Portuguese may well have been his first language. Here's the thing, that was the first edition of the book. I have the second edition, where he concludes that he was wrong, and Fitzjames's mother was likely English. I'm pretty sure they had access to that information, seeing as that edition was out for several years before they made this, and they just went with the outdated stuff because it's a bit more dramatic. Plus, it creates more parallels and camaraderie between him and Crozier. Are we brothers, Francis? I would like that very much. One thing the show never mentions, and I'm kinda sure the book never mentions, is that Crozier was known to his close friends as Frank. It would have been a nice, subtle thing if in the flashbacks he was called Frank by Sophia Crackcroft and Sir James Ross, and in this scene asked Fitzjames to call him Ed. Gonna take a little sidetrack for a moment. I went to a talk by Russell Potter, one of the world's top experts in the Franklin Expedition, about the cutlery in the expedition. Yes, I am that big of a nerd. He explained that among the personalised officer's cutlery found was some of the monogram of a cockatrice, an unnatural beast that is born from a cockerel's egg, and he felt that could be Fitzjames's cutlery and he was making a private joke of his own origins. 
Fitzjames's plan in the real history was apparently to conquer the passage, do groundbreaking science along the way. He was put in charge of the expedition's science, even though that wasn't his area of expertise, then disembark in Russia, walk home and read a best-selling memoir, hopefully getting a title and a promotion, the shining capstone to a self-made legend. When they returned to camp, they found out that Farr and Irving had been murdered by Hickey and some crewmen have butchered the Inuit from the last episode in Revenge. Farr was scalped, that happened in the book too, because Hickey had read some lurid tales of frontier violence further south and assumed that, meh, same continent, close enough. The stem of the episode is the paranoia that Hickey's created about violent Inuit, the fear that they will attack, which he intends to use to stage his mutiny. There is zero evidence that I know of of violence between the Inuit and the crews. A few historians, usually of the patriotic British persuasion, have theorised that the cutting wounds of the bones of the crew were the result of them being murdered by the Inuit, rather than desperate cannibalism. I believe that Franklin's people were attacked by the natives, and not only that, that they were mutilated afterwards, the bodies were mutilated. But think about this. We have a group of people who know to survive in the Arctic and people who don't. We have large groups of people and we have smaller individual groups of people. We have desperate groups of people with firearms and people without firearms just living their regular lives. If violence occurred, which of these groups do you think is more likely to do it to the other? Even if the Inuit were starving and desperate, they were better off than the crews who'd be even more starving and even more desperate. I'm not saying violence didn't occur, we don't know, but if it did, I'd be shocked if the Inuit started it. They've really improved the look of the island between the last episode and this one. It looks much less distractingly Mediterranean now. Yes, I know it's the Adriatic, same difference. Hickey's mutiny is coming together. He's turned many of the men against the Inuit and Crozier. And through Sergeant Tozer, he's got the Marines on board. Scurvy is running rampant among the crews and Crozier's hunting parties are bringing nothing back with them. The best thing for scurvy was obviously citrus fruit, but many things can help with that, even fresh meat. The north side of King William Island is desolate in real life, but the south side has plenty of game. How much? Well, other explorers have written about having to throw away excess food. The fact that so many of the crews starved in the south side or just over the water on the mainland probably indicates that most of them were incredibly far gone by the time they got to the hunting grounds. Too weak to do much but walk, crawl or wait to die. Of course, them having little or no arctic hunting experience didn't help either. In the book, it's the tunback that's keeping them from finding fresh meat. It's driving animals away or killing them to mock the crews. They don't make it clear, but it looks like something like that was happening in the show too. One of the lesser known effects of scurvy is that it reopens old wounds. Fitzjames' story about being shot in China is coming back to haunt him. When I was pierced, single musket ball, size of a cherry, passed clean through my arm and kept on in, making a third wound here, entering my chest. This is a good time to remind you that Fitzjames wrote a 10,000 word comedy poem about that battle. It's called The Ballad of HMS Cornwallis, and it is terrible. One of the books I've read went into great detail about Fitzjames's many war wounds, before calmly mentioning that once scurvy set in, he was unlikely to last long. This makes it even funnier that another Franklin novel, The Broken Lands, has Fitzjames survived to the very end with no problem whatsoever. This is the same book that has Crozier turned to Colonel Kurtz from Apocalypse Now, has the lead being Cayenne Pepper, has some bullies beat the shit out of an innocent young crewman called Cornelius Hickey, and has Gore live long enough to see the message about his death be stored in a cairn. It's a fun alternate universe. The mutiny is diffused somewhat when Crozier has good sir perform an autopsy in Irving and discovers the seal meat in his stomach. That seal meat, sir. Barely digested. They fed him. Of course they did. Hickey and Tozer are arrested and the gallows is quickly built. They're to be hanged for mutiny and the murder and mutilation of two officers and the murder of the Inuit family. So Hickey begins to recite the letter that Crozier wrote back in episode 3, when he was planning on abandoning the ships to seek help himself. There are many feats that preoccupy a captain's imagination, but abandoning his ship and his men should not be among them. If you remember the raft of the Medusa video I did, you'll remember that in the 19th century, the concept of the captain going down with a ship, or at the very least the captain staying with the ship until the crew is safe, wasn't just a matter of honor. It was law, and one that the captains could be executed for breaking. Now, the Medusa was France 30 years earlier, and Captain Schmaltz wasn't sentenced to death. 
and the British Navy of 1845 wasn't generally into exiting deserters. But the whole idea gives Hickey's speech a bit more oomph and puts this exchange from episode 3 into a new light. So John will have your head, and if he doesn't call for it, the Admiralty certainly will. They can have it. So the Turnback accidentally saves Hickey and Tozer when he attacks the camp, killing at least a dozen men and eating Collins' soul. Weird timing, you might think, but Crozier released Lady Silence, surmising that bringing her back into a paranoid camp aflush with guns was likely a recipe for disaster. And it kinda was. The Turnback hadn't bothered them since she completed the ritual, removed her tongue and rejoined the crews. And now she's gone and attacks. In the confusion, the mutineers managed to escape with food, guns, supplies and Dr. Goodsir. Fitzjames unleashes a bunch of rockets at the Turnback. Real life Fitzjames had experience with rockets, as he'd mentioned during a story in the first episode. But I'm not aware of the actual expedition bringing any along with that. And even less aware of why they might. We end with the crew split into two separate bands. Crozier's larger group and Hickey's smaller one. We know this happened in real life. The crew split into a number of smaller bands during the march south. But we don't know why. It could have been planned, mutiny, accident, or any number of reasons. 